Good morning, everybody. This is Abhi Saharia from DiscoverX. I am really excited uh, to be the moderator for this webinar this morning. Today, we are going to be talking about uh, enabling cancer immunotherapy from discovery to combination. Our speakers today will be Dr. Jane Lamerdin and Dr. Alison O'Mahony, and I will give the introduction in just a minute here. Before we get started, uh, a couple of administrative announcements is that this webinar is being recorded uh, and a copy of the recorded webinar as well as a copy of uh, the slides will be available to you shortly after uh, the end of the webinar. A quick reminder that during the course of the webinar, this all your microphones are muted and so uh, any questions that you would have, please type them into the chat box or the Q&A box that you can find on the drop-down menus on WebEx and we would be happy to have those questions addressed by the speakers at the end of uh, the webinar. With that said, I'd like to take a second to introduce to you Dr. Jane Lamerdin and Dr. Alison Mahoney. Jane is the Director of R&D in the ESC Division of DiscoverX, and she oversees the development of novel cell-based assays for discovery as well as bioassays for lot release and potency applications. Jane has over 15 years of experience developing cell-based assays to support drug discovery, high-content screening, and systems biology research. Prior to joining DiscoverX, Jane led a team of multidiscipli multidisciplinary scientists and bioinformaticians at Odyssey Terra to develop a high-throughput, high-content cell-based assay panel for drug mechanism of action, selectivity, and safety profiling which supported multi-year projects for pharmaceutical, biotechnology, and government clients. Dr. Alison O'Mahony is currently the Vice President of Research Biology focused on DiscoverX's proprietary biomap screening platform. Alison has considerable expertise and experience in phenotypic screening and developing in vitro systems as predictive models of drug discovery. Prior to joining the Biomap team, Allison was an investigator at the Gladstone Institute at UCSF and has over 25 years of specialization in cell biology, signal transduction, and biomarker expression. So without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to Jane, who's going to walk us through the first part of uh, the webinar, and um, we all look forward to it. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Avi, and thank you to everyone online who is uh, joining us for this webinar today. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to start out by uh, just highlighting that this webinar is really going to be presenting an overview of the products and services that we as a company uh, provide um, to support cancer immunotherapy development. And uh, historically, DiscoverX has uh, been a premier provider of target-based cell-based assays um, for screening and hit identification as well as lead optimization. And we have um, adapted many, many of those assays um, to serve as um, assays for characterization and lot release downstream in the late stages of drug development and post-approval. So with that um, goal in mind, we are developing similar products and services for uh, the checkpoint uh, receptor assays and also our killer cytotoxicity um, assay. In, uh, as Abby has mentioned, in the second half of our uh, presentation, Allison will be sharing with you more details on our phenotypic uh, screening panel or biomap and how that can be applied to characterization of your um, immunotherapy um, molecule. So to begin, Let's start with the products and services for checkpoint assays. Here we go. All right. So as you all are aware, there's been um, a huge amount of success in the clinic with uh, inhibitory antibodies targeting certain uh, checkpoint receptors known as inhibitory receptors, primarily PD-1 and CTLA-4. And with that success has come a lot of interest in developing additional molecules um, 
targeting other receptors, both for monotherapy and um, combination therapy, to improve outcomes for patients. And so these can be targeting other inhibitory receptors, such as TIM3 or LAG3 with blocking antibodies, or uh, targeting the co-stimulatory receptors, such as GITR or OX40. Um, but the, the problem in the field, of course, is that the, the tools that are available to develop these assays are somewhat sparse, and um, investigators really need to utilize a primary human cells um, to, to be able to focus on the biology. And the problem with working with primary cells, as we all know, is that they can be somewhat finicky to culture. They have a lot of uh, variability due to donor-to-donor -donor heterogeneity. Um, and because of the endpoints that one is utilizing to, um, to study these particular receptors, they can often have long and complicated protocols. Um, stimulating T cells is complicated enough on its own, and then when you're looking at proliferation or cytokine secretion, some of these assays can run for many days. But I think the most challenging aspect of working with the primary human cells for screening is that these particular assays are not specific for the target receptor of your molecule. There are many other receptors that are present, and so teasing out the, the uh, specificity of your molecule can be somewhat challenging. So because of the experience uh, DiscoverX has had over the years in developing target-based cell-based assays, uh, we have begun the expansion of a portfolio of checkpoint receptor assays. And our approach was to build what we call tractable cell models that are expressing the native receptor um, and are looking at early signaling events. So these are not binding assays, but rather assays that would allow you to interpret whether your molecules are blocking signaling. And of course, if you're going to work with tractable cell models, the preference is to have fast and easy protocols that can be transferred between labs, oh, sorry, <laughs> between labs and um, uh, downstream when you're when you're transferring these to uh, to late stage uh, groups that are uh, doing manufacturing, a fast and easy protocol is, is is extremely important. And then finally, these assays, by their nature, are assay specific for the the target a checkpoint receptor. So when we uh, set out to define how we were going to build these assays, our objective was to look at an early step in the signaling pathway for um, these receptors. And, um, and that's, again, to improve the specificity of the assay um, by looking at an early event as opposed to um, a downstream um, transcriptional reporter readout, for example, or, or a secretion of a cytokine. So to take uh, the PD-1 assay as, as an example, um, what we focused on was the biology. And in this particular case, PD-1 is a receptor on the surface of the T cell that has um, specific motifs in the C-terminal tail that are phosphorylated upon ligand engagement. So these are phosphorylation sites that um, uh, are phosphorylated by intracellular kinases. And these phosphorylated motifs result in recruitment of proteins known as ship phosphatases. And by virtue of the co-localization of PD-1 with the T cell receptor, these ship phosphatases are then able to uh, downregulate proximal signaling kinases activity on the TCR and thus attenuate TCR signaling. So our goal was to build an assay that would allow us to look at this early recruitment step, which is the recruitment of the ship phosphatase to the tail of the PD-1 receptor. And so we did this by building a co-culture system, much like you would um, in your, uh, with your primary cells. But here we're using GERCAT cells, which are a T-cell model, where we've expressed a full-length PD-1 and at the C-terminal tail, we have attached one half of our beta-gal reporter. And in the same cells, we're co-expressing the shipped phosphatase fused to the other fragment of our beta-gal reporter. So upon um, co-incubation or co-culturing, if you will, of the, um, these particular PD-1-expressing cells with a, um, a, a ligand-expressing cell line, which, which 
replicates our, our tumor model. Um, what we see then is a recruitment of the ship phosphatase to the C-terminal tail, and this reconstitutes beta-gal activity, and we can detect that interaction by adding substrate and um, reading that signal out on a luminometer. So the beauty of this assay is that it is a very straightforward, homogeneous assay that can be performed in under six hours. So the cartoon on the left is just showing you how this assay has been implemented um, in the 96-well format. We plate our cells, we add um, our pre-incubate with our antibody for an hour, add our ligand-presenting cells, which, which can either be PDL1 or PDL2, incubate for another one to two hours, and then add our detection reagent. That is incubated for an hour, and then we read that out on a luminometer, benchtop luminometer. So the data that um, one obtains with these um, is quite robust, and I don't have all the time to show you all of our specificity data, but suffice it to say that on our website you can gain a lot more information about the development and all of the controls we've run. Um, but importantly, the assay responds not only to biologics, which are therapeutic antibodies in the clinic, such as pembrolizumab and nivolumab, as you can see in the top panel, um, but they also can be used to, uh, the assay can also be used to screen for small molecules, so inhibitors that will either inhibit the SARC kinases or other intracellular kinases involved in the signaling process, or as shown here in this slide, um, small molecules that are able to block the binding of PDL1 to PD1 and block that stimulation. So what you can see here in this bottom graph is um, an, a, a commercial anti-PD1 antibody, not the therapeutic antibody, um, and then also this one of these small molecule PD1, PDL1 inhibitors, and an unrelated um, kinase inhibitor, which is inactive or largely inactive in this assay. So I want to make the point here that these assays are extremely robust, and this approach that we've used in terms of this uh, recruitment type of assay can be applied to many other um, inhibitory receptors um, that are of interest. So I'm going to switch gears here a little now and talk about our assays for co-stimulatory receptor signaling. So as you're aware, these receptors are actually from a different um, type of uh, receptor family. They fall in the, the TNF receptor superfamily. And structurally, they behave differently. Um, they are actually a form a trimeric structure. And as can seen in this uh, simplified cartoon, in the, um, all of these receptors are known to signal either through non-canonical or canonical NF-kappa B uh, pathways. We've elected to look at the non-canonical in this particular um, example. So in the non-canonical pathway, when the receptor is not activated, there is a protein known as NIC or NF-kappa B inducing kinase which is very close to the, the, the uh, proximal to the receptor activation. And in, when the pathway is not being uh, stimulated, NIC is present at very low levels. So it's maintained by uh, ubiquitolation and the uh, proteasomal degradation. So when the pathway becomes activated by ligand binding and uh, clustering the, the trimer, then what we see is that um, ubiquitination process disappears, NIC is stabilized, and the NIC protein levels increase. And that results in downstream NF-kappa B signaling through uh, P105 processing. So we're able to look at this very early event in the non-canonical pathway by um, building an assay that fuses the full-length NIC protein to um, our PL tag, which is the small fragment of our beta-gal reporter. And this protein is then introduced into the cell type of interest. In this example, we're showing you to OS. And these stably expressing cells are then stimulated with ligand. And at the end of the incubation period, we lyse the cells in the presence of our substrate and exogenous enzyme acceptor, which is the other portion of our beta-gal reporter. And then we read that out on a luminometer. So it's a very simple, straightforward assay. 
So here is an example of how we've applied this technology to the OX40 receptor. And OX40 is um, not normally expressed in um, the uh, U2S background that we're showing here. So what you can see is that in the absence of OX40, there is no response to soluble OX40 ligand. But when you um, express the OX40 receptor, we get a nice dose-dependent increase in OX40 signaling, which is read out as NIC stabilization. Now, of course, the uh, therapeutic modality for um, stimulating these co-receptors is either agonistic antibodies or um, multimeric ligands. We um, were kindly provided a, a, a an aliquot, if you will, of OX40 antibody, which is the pogolizumab. And this particular antibody is known to be inactive unless um, you cross-link the antibody with FC gamma antibody. So shown here is an example of running the pogolizumab as an agonist um, in soluble mode, and you see that it does not stimulate the assay. But in the presence of the FC gamma antibody, we see a nice dose-dependent response. So this shows you that uh, pogolizumab and other OX40 agonist antibodies are able to stimulate the assay as well as soluble ligand. And we've had multiple customers using this for screening um, of their agonist antibodies. So another example in this category is our assay for 41BB or CD137. And similar to the, um, the OX40 assay, this is a, a receptor that has been introduced into U2OS cells that do not endogenously express CD137. And you can see, again, a very nice dose-dependent response to soluble ligands, shown here in pink, and um, a, a, an excellent response as well um, with actually improved efficacy with the urolumab, which is a, an antibody that's in phase one clinical trials. So both of these assays are suitable for screening not only soluble ligands and uh, multimeric ligands, but um, uh, agonistic antibodies. So uh, to summarize this section of the talk, we have built a large number of um, checkpoint assays that are targeting both inhibitory and co-stimulatory molecules. Um, this is the, the ones that are currently available on our website. Um, and this menu is expanding um, every month. These are assays that are engineered to be um, robust and reproducible, and so they are actually um, employ very easy and fast protocols so that implementation in different labs is, is uh, much easier than working with primary cells. They are also highly sensitive and, importantly, highly specific. The, um, and what we've demonstrated for um, all of these is that they're amenable, at least the, they're amenable to biologics, and many of them we've tested with small molecules as well. So I do want to um, point out that we have another assay platform that uh, can also be relevant for, um, for IONC molecules, and this is our human interleukin um, portfolio. We've built um, over 40 assays that are targeting different human interleukins and cytokines. Um, I show you a subset here that are, um, are important um, stimulatory molecules, if you will, um, serving either as adjuvants or um, agonists that can be used in combination with immunotherapy. Um, so the, in, this, in both of these cases, what we're looking at are assays that are engineered to express the, the receptors, and we're monitoring um, ligand-induced heterodimerization of these receptors. Um, in the case of IL-2, the high affinity receptor is, is actually a trimer of um, three receptors. And what you can see, again, very nice dose-dependent responses, and these assays are extremely robust and um, quite useful in late stage um, for QC and, and lot release. I wanted to finish up by talking a little bit about our killer cytotoxicity assay platform. And this is a, a, a platform that we've developed that works with immune-relevant effector cells to measure target cell death in co-cultures. And so what we've done here is we've actually used our EFC technology to engineer a reporter into the target cells that are expressing your antigen of interest. 
And um, once that, uh, this happens to be this reporter protein is um, a housekeeping gene that is very well tolerated by um, over 30 different cell lines that we've tested so far um, to be expressed at, at high levels and stably over at least 15 pathogens. So these cells can then be used in a number of different um, effector-based assays. In this cartoon, what we're showing is that you plate your target cells with the drug, which we assume here is an antibody, um, and the effector cells of choice. And when the cells are killed, they release this protein, this um, pro-label tag protein, out into the media. And we can detect the release of that protein into the media by adding our detection reagent, which contains the enzyme acceptor, or the other portion of our beta-gal reporter. And then we simply read this output on um, a aluminometer, as we have talked about earlier. So what, what's nice about this platform is that it's broadly applicable to many different effector-mediated killing applications, um, ones that for which we've seen data or generated data ourselves include ADCC, CDC, and ADCP. Um, and uh, uh, a number of groups are starting to evaluate this for CAR-T, and it, it would also be applicable to other adoptive T-cell therapies. And then um, we're getting a lot of traction with um, groups that are using this for T-cell redirection, and I'll show you an example. So ADCC was the first application we developed this platform for. Um, it is um, the protocol we, that you can see here is, is very straightforward. We have, um, we're able to generate data in um, less than six hours, typically, depending on the antibody. And an example data set is shown here on the right. This is a pool, um, NCI-N87, that um, cancer cell line that expresses both EGFR and HER2, although the HER2 expression is, is much higher. And you can see that the uh, response to the two therapeutic antibodies, the tuximab and trastuzumab, is uh, quite robust and um, that we're getting good um, percent ADCC. This has um, been validated with PBMCs. We've, all, we've also used um, uh, NKs and NK92 cells and, um, and other types of engineered uh, T cell effectors, and they all work well with this system. So another application of the, the killer um, cell lines is to actually look at ADCP. And this was um, actually initially tested by a group at Janssen who kindly shared their protocol with us. Um, and we have subsequently replicated uh, their data. What we're showing is that instead of looking at release of the killer protein into the media, we're actually looking at the cells being degraded by the macrophage. So we're seeing a, a loss of signal. Um, so the protocol, again, is very straightforward. Um, one does have to differentiate your monocytes into macrophages first, so that's probably the most difficult portion of the uh, protocol. Um, but then the rest of it is all done in a single plate, does not require um, putting these on to a flow cytometer. And what you can see on the right is data from two independent experiments with the same um, donor um, from which we uh, differentiated the macrophages, and the results are extremely reproducible um, between experiments. Finally, I just wanted to highlight an example of using this assay for T cell redirection. Um, as you're probably aware, the T cell redirection assay is one that um, utilizes bispecific antibodies that are targeting um, what, where one arm is targeting the, the target cell and the other is bringing the effector to the target cell. Um, the protocol here, again, is very, very straightforward. Um, because of the stability of our, um, our killer protein in the, uh, in the media, one can interrogate this, um, uh, interrogate the effect of your uh, molecules out to 72 hours and still see robust um, signal, as shown here. This is data from um, Immunocore with one of their molecules. And what you can see with the blue is that this is their antigen-specific molecule, and the red is a negative control. At 24 hours, we are getting about 20% killing, but um, if you let the assay go longer, out to 72 hours, where more of the molecules are activating the T cells, you're actually seeing an increase in signal. 
um, with a similar um, potency and a good separation between that and the negative control. So this is again another um, excellent um, application for killer because of the, the low background that one has in this assay. So just to summarize the benefits of the killer um, assay platform, the specificity is excellent because we're measuring target cell death alone and none of the effectors. Um, it's a very easy to use protocol. We have exquisite sensitivity and the flexibility of being able to run the assay over a range of 30 minutes out to 72 hours um, gives you a lot of opportunity to test different types of effectors. Um, finally, I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, we, we have a lot of expertise in, in building different types of cell-based assays. We're working with a number of clients now in the checkpoint um, space to build custom assays for them. So if you don't see the assay or the target of your interest, um, please feel free to reach out to us. We have been working in this custom space for over eight years and have worked on over 700 projects for pharma and biotech companies. We have a lot of experience in developing and delivering on um, on custom projects. So with that, I'd like to now turn the, the um, speaking over to Allison O'Mahony, who is going to discuss the, uh, the Biomap panel and the application of that to your immunotherapy drugs. Thank you, Jane. Uh, good morning, afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll just get the transition of slides going here. So as Jane said today, I will be talking about our Biomap services. Uh, the Biomap phenotypic screening platform has been applied to um, progressing or uh, advancing compounds from early discovery through, in fact, into evaluating or assessing feasibility or suitability of clinical combinations. So long the industry standard for primary human cell-based disease models, the Biomap phenotypic screening platform is overviewed in these next two slides. Essentially, we start using uh, primary cell types pooled from uh, multiple healthy donors, uh, the goal of which is to capture more robust population responses as opposed to individual potentially highly variant individual donor responses. The human primary cell types selected represent various tissue and disease and physiological situations used to screen compounds for efficacy and safety. These primary cell types are cultured or co-cultured in complex uh, um, systems stimulated um, to recapitulate human tissue and disease uh, and signaling states or disease states. Uh, compounds are profiled in these systems, and what I mean by a biomap system specifically is a particular set of primary cell types, a particular set or, or environmental stimulation conditions, and a particular set of validated, optimized and validated protein-based assay readouts. So compounds are tested in a medium uh, for, medium throughput format on 96 or three, uh, 384 well plates alongside vehicle controls. So compounds are arrayed in this plate format alongside the assay controls. Because all of the cells used in biomap screening systems are human, these assays are amenable to testing both small and large molecules and indeed combinations thereof. And then in addition to developing and validating these complex biological disease models, we have also generated a compelling suite of bioinformatics and data mining tools designed to provide not only expert analysis and interpretation of your data, but actually um, actionable information to guide compound progression, again, from discovery through to, to clinical positioning. So as Jane already highlighted, there are a number of uh, challenges in testing com uh, uh, compounds for this particularly unique uh, immunotherapeutic anti-cancer strategy. 
uh, the in vitro assays, while providing very compelling target-centric data, as Jane just illustrated, um, frequently use individual cell types that may uh, lack the complexity of the tumor microenvironment for a broader or, or a, a, a more physiological insight. The alternative is often animal xenograft models, but these are expensive, they're not high throughput, and we have found not only in immune oncology, but in a number of cases, that they are not greatly or, or, or well predictive of what will happen in the uh, clinical, the human clinical situation. Again, um, uh, uh, many in vitro assays uh, necessarily have a bias towards specific targets or, or signaling pathways. And there, this is undermined also by the um, general lack of clinical response biomarkers that have been validated in this space. Um, preclinical testing, of course, is, is technically challenging because there's limited insight then onto the broad patient biology. Um, and combination strategies are often uh, not rationally designed or are often um, um, elected on an iterative process based on clinical uh, experience, but not really employing an evidence-based approach. So with these and, and other challenges, um, we believe the, there are opportunities to um, apply the biomap technology in this respect, and these are the opportunities. Our um, approach is a systems biology approach in which our in vitro assays actually, actually do recapitulate or mirror the complexity of tissue compartments. In the case of the oncology systems, our uh, um, assays contain tissue cell types, immune cell types, and cancer cell types designed to model the tumor microenvironment biology. Our assays are optimized validated and run to an SOP to ensure robust and reproducible and actionable uh, uh, screening information for both small and large molecules. Um, our systems are validated with a number of standards of care and me mechanistic tool compounds, which allows us to uh, uh, share insight and guidance based on the uh, uh, client compounds that are screened, and we have found that our readouts are indeed physiologically relevant and clinically predictive. The panels are agnostic for specific targets. In other words, we're focused largely on the disease biology and, and creating the compartments and cell types to model that and not really biasing it for any uh, a particular target. And then our readouts have translational value um, to uh, assess and predict the impact of the compound. In addition, um, as I said earlier, because these are all human cell-based assay systems, they're amenable to testing both uh, compounds on individual basis as monotherapeutic compounds, as well as combination strategy. And our goal is to not only inform on the suitability of the response to these combinations, um, but also to provide insight on dosing. So um, as I said, initially biomap systems were built to model tissue and disease uh, biological states, but uh, some years ago we adapted these tissue models to include cancer cell lines as, an, as a tumor influence on the uh, microenvironment biology. So here are, is an overview of the systems that we have built with two specific cancer cell lines modeling colorectal adenocarcinoma with an H2, HD29 and non-small cell lung cancer with an H1299 cell line. So in essence, the microenvironment models that we've built contain either fibroblast primary cell types pooled from multiple donors used at very low passage to maintain intact and physiologically relevant signaling networks and regulatory uh, signaling pathways and regulatory networks. The fibroblasts are co-cultured with immune cells and the specific cancer cell line that I've referred to to make a stromal immune tumor microenvironment model. In parallel, we've developed endothelial cell-based uh, uh, biomap tumor microenvironment models in which HUVEC are, again, from multiple healthy donors are pooled with PBMCs from multiple healthy donors and the specific cancer cell lines. 
Um, this has given rise to two panels, CRC and NSCLC, with two component model systems, the stromal or fibroblast-based model and the vascular or endothelial cell-based model with HD29 or H1299 cells, respectively. These panels, then, are plated on a multi-well um, format and allowed to come to confluence uh, for a, um, a period of time before assay. The test agents, again, small or large molecules, are added just prior to stimulation, and the assay is incubated for 48 hours. After the assay is concluded, we harvest supernatant and then read um, uh, protein-based readouts either directly on the complex co-culture with an on-cell ELISA-like approach or with a, a measure it in the supernatant as a soluble um, response biomarker. The result is we assess the impact of compounds on this host tumor immune biology. A little bit of background information on the biology that we are indeed modeling and that is used to assess compounds is shown in this slide. Here we have measured the immune response or the immune functional response from the deconstructed compartments within the tumor microenvironment uh, systems. Uh, in essence, we are testing the stimulation that we use on these different uh, cultures or co-cultures. The stimulation used in this system, um, um, represented here as stro 29 and indeed the other systems that I've just highlighted, includes a submitogenic level of T-cell receptor agonists designed to prime and activate the T-cells, but not drive their proliferation. This recapitulates the resident immune cells that one sees in an intratumoral space, where they are um, activated and were recruited to the tumor mass, but are not cycling and expanding to an effective uh, population. Here, when we look at the ability of these interferon, of these cells to make these immune cytokine interferon gamma um, in response to the stimulation, we see, as expected, neither the fibroblasts nor the cancer cells make uh, this inflammatory cytokine. In contrast, PBMCs alone make a robust uh, expression level of interferon gamma or have a robust expression level of interferon gamma in response to T-cell receptor agonist engagement. This response is enhanced when these PBMCs are uh, co-cultured with fibroblasts. Indeed, this system or these compartments would represent an inflamed fibro fibroblast type of environment, such as a synovial joint, for example, in rheumatoid arthritis. Of interest, we see that when we incubate either the PBMCs alone or the PBMC's fibroblast co-culture with the cancer cell line to introduce a, a tumor influence into this co-culture, we see marked inhibition of the ability of the PBMCs to make inflammatory cytokines. So there is a clear demonstration that the addition of the tumor cell into the uh, stimulation environment of these systems suppresses the uh, inflammation responses with respect to immune cytokine production. This is consistent with the unique immune biology or immune status of the intratumoral space that is um, the target of these immunotherapeutic strategies. Now, I've told you that for all of the primary cell types, both the tissue fibroblasts that are the tissue vascular endothelial cells, as well as the immune cells, we pool our cell types from multiple healthy donors to represent population responses. These are, of course, are conditions that are amenable to activation by an MLR-type biology. So to evaluate exactly how much, if any, MLR was contributing to the signaling environment in the biomass systems, we ran this experiment where we basically compared the uh, system using PBMCs from individual donors versus the MLR-competent systems in which we are using PBMCs from pooled donors. Um, the first result that I want to show you is that if you look where the blue arrows are highlighting on the right-hand side of the screen, we see little or no induction of interferon gamma production in 48 hours in the absence of exogenous T-cell receptor agonist stimuli, but in an MLR-competent environment. So MLR is contributing very little to the activation signal when you compare it to the MLR 
non-individual um, uh, uh, PBMC donor-based systems. In contrast, the stimulation by these exogenous T-cell receptor agonists markedly uh, induces, as expected, the production of interferon gamma, both in the individual donor-based systems as well as the uh, pooled-based systems. But the second piece of information revealed from this study illustrates the need for a robust and reproducible signal for screening model systems. And what we see on the right-hand side of the slide is when we pool the PBMCs and stimulate them in our systems, we get a much more reproducible response across donor pools and therefore necessary for ongoing screening campaigns to allow a, 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 a phenotypic signature or phenotypic profile to be generated. In contrast, on the left-hand side, we see very high, essentially uh, screening incompatible levels of variation between individual donors. Indeed, if one were to look at a donor four as a model system relative to donor two, donor four looks almost uh, 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 already immune uh, suppressed relative to donor two. The other uh, important um, thing to remember is when compounds are tested in, in biomass systems, they are tested relative to the vehicle control on the same plate. So whatever inherent biology is occurring in the compound treated cells is the same as the vehicle control cells. The result of screening a compound generates a biomap phenotypic signature or profile such as we have shown here. Uh, on the bottom, we're looking at the levels of the protein-based readouts, um, or excuse me, the specific protein-based readouts, and on the y-axis, the, the individual levels. The components of a system, so you understand what I mean when we go through the data, are uh, highlighted here. Again, on the top, we have the specific system icon uh, and name modeling a particular tumor microenvironment biology. Here we have stromal uh, tissue fibroblasts co-cultured with immune cells and HD29 colorectal adenocarcinoma cell line stimulated in such a way as to prime or activate the T cells but not have them cycling. Along the bottom, we have protein-based readouts. If they have um, uh, named, and these are well-known translatable, um, uh, translation-friendly or translation-compatible readouts. Uh, if they are prefaced with a small s, they're measured in the supernatant as soluble readouts, or otherwise they're measured directly on the, the co-culture of the uh, oncology system. Along the y-axis, we have the relative expression. This is the log ratio of the level of the readout exposed to the compound at a particular concentration relative to the vehicle control in the same experiment. So this allows you to see compound treatment specific activities either increased above or below the uh, parallel executed control sample. In the background, we have another uh, level of significance, and this, this is a gray envelope that represents the 95% historical control envelope, and so reflects the inherent variance uh, observed in the vehicle control around this readout. So if your compound affects a readout outside this envelope, it will, um, uh, you, you know that it's a real biological activity. In addition, in the oncology systems, compounds are uh, treated or, excuse me, tested in triplicate to allow us to uh, apply a p-value statistical rigor to the, to the uh, activity. Uh, compound effects are annotated for that specific readout and then that's subject to interpretation. Um, and uh, we, our standard format is to test a compound at four concentrations. So the type of analysis provided back is, is really just um, shown here at a top line level. So this is a profile for GSK's trametinib or mechanist that was approved in 2013 uh, for metastatic melanoma and is a standard of care combination therapy now um, used in conjunction with dibrafenib um, as a, a, a BRAF-MEC uh, uh, combination therapy. 
But the monotherapy uh, uh, of trametinib, uh, the impact of it in the oncology system is to strongly inhibit <clears throat> immune cell cytokine production. Now remember, this is already an immune compromised um, uh, function in the context of the tumor microenvironment model here. And we find that uh, further inhibition of the uh, T cell stimulation pathways engaged with the uh, T cell receptor agonists are, are evident by a strong and dose dependent decrease in cytokine production. But in addition, we see this compound's effects on other compartments within the tumor microenvironment. We see increased matrix uh, uh, related protein levels with collagen 3 being increased above the control and indeed outside the historical control levels. We also see inhibition of inflammation biomarkers, and indeed, this is consistent with the mechanism of action of um, uh, MEK inhibition. Now, when we look at compounds more uh, uh, related to the immunotherapeutic or ion space, we actually see a pattern of activities that reflect restored or recovered immune function by uh, the increase in cytokine production in both STRO HD29 and VASC HD29 uh, biomap microenvironment models. This pattern of activities in, is indeed consistent with an ion potential where the uh, antibody has been shown to have a recovery or restoration uh, impact associated with recovered immune status. Indeed, we see a similar pattern of activities or immune recovered pattern of activities with enhanced cytokine levels across both panels with both pembrolizumab and nivolumab. So we see a highly similar um, uh, level of immune recovery with these two PD-1 antibodies in these two biomap oncology panels. When validating these panels during development, we made an initial interesting observation that one of the standard of care drugs, paclitaxel, also had a pattern of activities consistent with uh, ion potential. This was unexpected to us, and in fact was prior um, was was observed prior to anybody looking at paclitaxel. However, since then, it's actually been uh, employed in a number of clinical trials, both with ipilimumab as well as uh, development lag three compounds or anti lag three compounds. But in essence, what you see here is at uh, uh, concentrations that are at or below clinical exposure levels, we see that paclitaxel has a lot of activities, but some of those activities include a, a increased cytokine production consistent with immune recovery or immune restoration in these tumor microenvironment models. This would identify then a small molecule as having a profile consistent with monotherapeutic application or even combination application in the ion space. To explore this as a paclitaxel effect or a mechanism effect, we looked at another member of these microtubule stabilizers. This is also a clinical compound which has the same mechanistic target or the same mechanistic uh, mode of action as paclitaxel being a microtubule stabilizer, but completely structurally unrelated compound. So no scaffold effect here, and what we see is a preservation of the immune recovered or increased cytokine production with both of these agents at the same uh, 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 subclinical exposure levels. So this clearly is a pattern of activities that is preserved with this mechanistic class. Um, but it also illustrates that the biomap technology can be used to evaluate ion potential both for large molecules, as we've shown with the anti-PD-1s, and for small molecules, as we've shown here for microtubule stabilizers. Interestingly enough, we've also uh, observed a, an increased pattern of immune cytokine production with EGF receptor kinase, small molecule EGF receptor kinase inhibitors used in the clinic, uh, specifically erlotinib and gefitinib, or Tarceva and Iressa, as, as they're uh, um, known clinically, and a similar pattern of immune activity with the related large molecule in this space, cetuximab, the uh, anti-EGF receptor uh, antibody. So here we have demonstration that this immune um, 
supporting or immune restoring impact uh, seen with mechanistic matches can be seen both with large and small molecules, which makes it terribly exciting for this to be a uh, biology that can be uh, uh, recruited and therapeutically applied with both small and large molecules. Um, now, what I've shown you is the activity of these compounds within this very unique immune privileged environment in these microenvironment models mediated by the cancer cells. But our platform technology, Diversity Plus, which has been around for, for over a decade now, was originally designed to take a systems biology approach to the entire patient, to evaluate compounds phenotypically for their impact beyond where the expected target engagement was, was, was relevant. And so in this panel of 12 systems, they're all primary cell-based at modeling immune, tissue, vascular, uh, structural biology, fibrosis related, um, 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 including fibrosis and the inflammation related readouts to assess what the compound's impact is on broad patient biology. So in the immunotherapeutic space, we have used this platform essentially to evaluate compounds outside the influence of a tumor or cancer cell. So here is the Biomat Diversity Plus profile of paclitaxel. Now remember I showed you paclitaxel like its mechanistic um, um, partner or like its mechanistic uh, uh, compound epithylone D all serve to increase immune and inflammatory uh, functions in the tumor microenvironment model. But here in the patient model or tissue and disease patient model, we actually see paclitaxel having both an, an, a broad anti-proliferative impact as well as an inhibitory or anti-inflammatory impact. So the gray arrows here show the inhibition of proliferation of multiple primary cell types, including endothelial cells, at T and B cells, coronary artery smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts. And this is consistent with this drug being an anti-cancer drug to block the proliferation of cell types. But in addition, in contrast or opposite to what I've showed you in the microenvironment model, we see that paclitaxel can inhibit both inflammatory cytokines as well as chemokines. And so therefore, outside the tissue, this drug is actually an immune inhibiting drug outside the tumor tissue. Um, we can also interpret, and this is a, a good thing, because the immunotherapeutic strategy should be localized to the privileged immune, or to the immune privileged tumor microenvironment. We can also, based on our, our, our history of profiling thousands of compounds for the Biomap database, help correlate and annotate and interpret these activities, not only with respect to efficacy, but also with respect to uh, safety. We know that anti-proliferative effects on vascular cell types has impact outside um, the tumor, and in, indeed, is, a, is our sentinel activities that um, uh, direct compounds more to an, an oncology indication than, for example, an autoimmune indication, because disrupting the uh, vasculature using uh, via uh, anti-proliferative effects on endothelial cells or coronary artery smooth muscle cells uh, has been associated with an increased risk for um, uh, thrombotic or cardiovascular related adverse events. And we know that this is borne out with paclitaxel uh, uh, in the clinic. Now, when we look at the uh, anti-PD-1 pembrolizumab, we see uh, uh, essentially an inactive profile. So unlike its activities at the same exposure concentrations in the tumor microenvironment model, pembrolizumab and nivolumab are essentially flat or inactive, and they are not inherently inflammatory. This is, is a very important point to evaluate compounds that have the potential for cytokine storm-like um, um, impact, as we saw uh, almost a decade ago with the anti-CD28 antibody. So here we see that um, unlike its activities in the tumor microenvironment biomap systems, in these systems, they, these, they show no evidence of increasing inflammatory and immune cytokine production. Uh, finally, the mathematical approach to, these com to evaluating these complex biological systems has really provided a lot of value and information to testing compounds, both as monotherapies and their feasibility as combination therapies, either for enhanced activities 
or the identification of novel activities resulting from pharmacodynamic interactions between compounds, but also being able to assess the impact of a compound, if not in rationally designed therapies, evaluating its impact when um, administered to a patient that has onboard therapies. And so this mathematical approach essentially involves testing the individual combination partner um, uh, versus the other combination partner, and then a four-by-four four dosing matrix of both agents uh, in combination. And this um, uh, provides an advantage to essentially identifying where the sweet spot of dosing is, which is something that's now not really being evidence-based and is more an iterative design in the clinic. And our goal really in this approach is to mathematically identify at what combination of compounds do we see that's most different from the individual agent. And here, as I showed you in this um, uh, presentation, paclitaxel and pembrolizumab alone give you a, 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 an immune act, a pattern of activities consistent with immune activation. And together, in combination, these same doses have an even greater effect on the immune restoration or immune recovered uh, cytokine production. And so this is, is designed to um, uh, illustrate how Biomap has been a, a, a broadly applied technology to assess combinations of small molecules or combination of large molecules or combinations therein of both a large and a small molecule. So to summarize, Biomap testing of compounds large and small for ion potential can inform you on efficacy. Is my compound acting in such a way that it's, com it's, it's compelling to use within the complex environment of a tissue? Remember, tissues are, are, are designed or default to maintaining homeostasis or tolerance. So they are a player in this ion space. And then the cancer cells has, have cancer cells have exploited this biology to create this immune privileged um, status. So testing compounds in this complex biology for their effect on immune function has been a, a powerful tool for identifying efficacy. Likewise, our Parallel Diversity Plus allows you to evaluate the impact of your compound on a broad patient biology outside the tumor microenvironment. And finally, our mathematical robustness allows you to apply that rigorous testing to understanding the feasibility of your combination for either new activities or interactions or equipotent effects, but at lower exposures, which is always, always remains a key clinical goal. So with that, I will hand back to Abby to take over the moderating duties and um, uh, invite your questions and comments. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Alison and Jane, for um, this fantastic webinar. Uh, once again, as a reminder, any questions that anybody has, uh, please type them into the chat box or the Q&A box, and I will pass them along to the speakers to get addressed. There's a few questions that have already come in, so I'm going to pass those along. The first question is for Jane. The antibodies that we've tested so far in our checkpoint assays have, do they need to be cross-linked to be functional in the Discover X checkpoint assays? So we have tested um, antibodies in three of our checkpoint assays, or in, in this case, we're referring to the co-stimulatory molecules, I presume, um, for CD40, uh, CD137, and OX40. And it appears to be the case that only the, the OX40 antibody that we tested required cross-linking. The others were active in the absence of cross-linking. Next question is uh, also for Jane. It, it's for, uh, is the reporter protein stably expressed, and I assume this is in reference to the um, killer cell lines, is, is the reporter protein stably expressed in uh, the target cells? Yes, I, I didn't have much time to go into details about how we validate the, um, the cell models. Um, but we do look at expression over at least 15 passages. These are stable pools rather than clones because we are trying to maintain the original heterogeneity of the cancer cell lines. But we do evaluate 
um, stability of the reporter over 15 passages. And some of them we've tested out to 30 passages and found them to be uh, very stable. Thank you, Jane. Um, the next question is uh, for Allison. The question is uh, for the biologic, uh, in addition to the biologic checkpoint inhibitors uh, that you have shown data for, have we looked at any small molecules um, that affect uh, immune tumor interactions? Uh, thanks, Abby. Yes, we have looked at a number of small molecules. What I've shown today with the paclitaxel is, of course, a clinical small molecule um, to represent that, 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 that we can actually see this um, pattern of activities, these, this IONC-related uh, pattern of immune recovered activities with small molecules. Um, when we profile compounds for clients, that data remains, of course, uh, highly confidential for clients. So what we share are prototypical compounds that we've used to validate and explore our systems. And they, these also serve then as reference benchmarks that uh, clients can use to compare their test compounds against. Thank you, Alison. So the last question, just in the interest of time now, um, that I will ask is, uh, again, for Alison, is um, have we tested uh, in the Biomap platform any multi-specific antibodies, um, and how does that perform? Yeah, I mean, we're um, pretty agnostic with what we can test. Um, we can test uh, by specific antibodies. What's been interesting is, is some of the data we've seen when we've compared by specific antibodies to combinations of, of monovalent antibodies. And I believe that what this has really shown us is that uh, all antibodies, even monovalent antibodies, are in essence bispecific because they have biological impact both at their epitope engagement end as well as their isotype engagement end. And we know that IONC, this IONC space, this drug discovery space, is really critically dependent on the activity of the isotype or the FC gamma um, binding component of an antibody. So, uh, yes, we have profiled by specific uh, antibodies, but every antibody, um, you know, it, it, is, it has two components, the epitope and the isotype end, to evaluate and assess. So, um, thanks, Allison. So, or, the last question here for Jane would be, um, why is it relevant? To, check, uh, to test the checkpoint molecules in isolation, um, as we would do in our um, engineered assays, uh, versus having a system that can multiplex them all at once? Um, well, I think simply for the uh, for better understanding the mechanism of action of your molecules, I think it's important to know um, beyond just a binding assay, because sometimes that can give false positives, um, that your assay, that, your, that you have an assay that's giving you a specific readout for a particular receptor, and that you're, you're actually looking at either agonism or antagonism with that molecule. So it's really a, um, a mechanism of action uh, question, and uh, I think for most INDs, that's an expectation that you know that about your molecule. Great, thank you, Jane, um, and thank you, Allison. Um, with that said, we are a few minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, end uh, the webinar now. And I know that there are still additional questions that um, we can follow up with uh, after the webinar. Uh, to have to get additional information on all of these assays that uh, Jane and Allison have described in detail, uh, there is information on our website, uh, which is discoverx.com/ionc. Um, and feel free to please contact any one of us here uh, to find out additional information uh, with regard to any of the products and services uh, discussed today in today's webinar. So with that said, thank you again for your time and for your questions and your attention. And uh, we look forward to continuing this discussion with you uh, shortly thereafter. Thanks again and have a great day.